This is a video on how to obtain Social Security disability. This is not a substitute for legal advice. You should always obtain the counsel of an attorney before filing a Social Security disability claim. I'm Michael Steinhardt from the law firm of Steinhardt, Siskin, and Lieberman. And I'm Jordan Lieberman, also from the law firm of Steinhardt, Siskin, and Lieberman. And we're here to explain to you what you need to do in order to file a claim for Social Security Disability Benefits and what you need to show in order to win and be successful on that claim. So Jordan, first we really should discuss what the definition of Social Security Disability is. And there's really four important issues that uh, one has to consider. Number one is that the individual can't work. Number two is that the individual can't work for at least 12 months or it has a terminal illness. Number three is they can't work because of a physical or a mental condition, which is properly documented by medical reports. And number four, not only can't they do the work that they did before, but the individual is precluded from doing any other type of work. So who can file for disability? Um, as as uh, Mr. Steinhardt just said, you can't file for disability if you're still working. But there is a threshold amount where you can make a certain amount of money and still file a claim for disability benefits. That level is called the substantial gainful activity threshold. If you're making more than a certain amount of money, even if you're working part-time, you can't allege disability unless there's a very extreme circumstance. Um, that amount changes each year. In 2024, that amount is $1,550 per month. 2023, that amount was $1,470 per month. That's the amount before taxes. If you're making more than that, again, even if you're working part-time, you can allege disability because the standard for disability is are you able to work at the substantial gainful activity level? And if you're making more than that amount, you're working at the substantial gainful activity level. So there's not going to be anything you can do as far as a Social Security claim. If your work activity drops below that level, then you can file an application. So Jordan, we get calls all the time with people who ask us for information, uh, but they're still working, and unfortunately they can't help us. But as we know, you can't use the receipt or trying to get Social Security as a planning tool. It is really unpredictable. So you may find yourself being off from work for, for a year or, or longer before getting disability benefits. So we want to stress that Social Security benefits or trying to obtain Social Security disability benefits is not a planning tool. Yeah, there's no such thing as a guarantee when it comes to Social Security disability. You, you want to get your medical records together, establish, try to establish that you're disabled, but again, there is no such thing as a sure thing when it comes to Social Security disability. You may believe that you're disabled, we may believe that you're disabled, but the Social Security Administration is the one that makes the final determination. And what you need to do is you need to prove that your disability is severe enough that it keeps you from being able to do any type of full-time work. So you may be the most disabled person in the world, but you've got to have the medical records to back that up. And so the way we interpret your medical records, the way you interpret your medical records may not be the same way that Social Security interprets them. And that's why it's very important to realize that you don't want to use Social Security as a retirement planning tool as far as disability goes. So what's the first step? Um, I think the first step really is finding out if you're even qualified to obtain Social Security disability. And so how do you go about uh, finding that out? Well, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to go to ssa.gov. That's the Social Security website. Again, ssa.gov and retrieve your earnings statement. Your earnings statement is a Social Security document that lets you know if you have enough credits in the system to qualify for Social Security disability. Essentially, when you're working and you're paying your Social Security taxes into the system, you're paying premiums on a disability policy through the government. When you stop paying those premiums, your insurance coverage is going to run out at some point. So it's kind of like car insurance. If you pay your car insurance through the end of the year, and then the next year you'd say you're going to cancel your insurance, you crash your car, you call the insurance company, and you say, okay, I crashed my car, what can I do? They're going to say, well, you cancel your coverage. You're not, you're not paying the premiums anymore. Well, it's the same thing with Social Security. You've got to have enough coverage in the system, essentially enough credits to qualify in order to file an application. And the way you can see that is on your SSA.gov earnings statement. So you go to the website, SSA.gov, think you file a My Account, and through that My Account, you can obtain your Social Security statement, which you'll download or print it out. So when you contact your attorney, 
uh, or our office, you have a record of it, and we can see or your attorney can see whether or not you're even eligible. We get so many phone calls where people, let's say, are self-employed, and they haven't paid much taxes. They go to an accountant, and the accountant tries to save them taxes so they don't pay into the Social Security system. And as a result, when they want to get disability, they're not covered because they don't, because they don't have enough earnings for, uh, for, um, for their account. So uh, it, it's really important that um, you pay your taxes, obviously, and you can find out uh, by going to the website and getting your, your earnings statement. So... And one thing I just want to add to that mm-hmm. is that your credits typically expire. If you, if you have a consistent work history and you've been working for a number of years, your credits are typically going to expire five years after you stopped working. So that doesn't mean that you have to be found disabled as far as they don't have to make a decision within that five-year period. But Social Security has to find that your disability began and you became unable to do full-time work before your disability credits expired. So, uh, for instance, if your disability credits expired in, on December 31st of 2018, if Social Security makes a decision on July the 5th of 2024 that your disability began in 2017, then you're fine. But if they were to find that your disability began at a later date after your credits had expired, then you're not going to qualify for benefits. So that's really the key, is that Social Security not only has to find that you are disabled, but they have to prove, you have to prove that your disability began prior to the date that your credits expired. So, Jordan, let's say um, you file for disability and Social Security finds you're disabled on the date you say you're disabled. Do you get money right away? How, how does that work? So what happens is Social Security makes a decision in your case, and then the local Social Security office then has to process all the paperwork and make a determination to tell you how much money you're going to be entitled to as far as your back benefits and your monthly benefits. It does take some time, typically about two months or so, from the date of a decision until you actually get an award letter and, and see any money from Social Security. Nothing happens right away when it comes to uh, dealing with the Social Security Disability Act application. As far as the amount that you get per month, they'll give you an estimate of that figure in your earnings statement that you can download from ssa.gov. So you'll have some idea how much money you can expect per month from Social Security, but you're not going to know the exact figure until your case gets approved. As far as the, uh, as far as the back pay goes, your disability onset date is the date that you're alleging that you became disabled and unable to work. If Social Security finds that you became disabled on that date, Benefits begin five months after that point. Now, they do round up to the next month. So, for instance, if you are alleging that you became disabled January 5th of 2021, and Social Security agrees and finds that your disability did begin on January 5th, 2021, there are no benefits for February, March, April, May, or June. Benefits won't begin until July 1st of 2021. So there is that five-month waiting period, and again, you do have to round up to the next month before that five-month period begins. As far as back pay goes, you can go back one year from the date you filed the application to collect back pay, but you can't go back any further than when you stopped working. And again, you still have that five-month waiting period. Now, I know this is a little complicated and it's, uh, you know, I'm getting a little into the weeds here, but just so people understand, there is that five-month waiting period and there is a cap on how far back you can go. If you wait four years after you stopped working to file your application, you can't go back all the way to the point that you stopped working to collect back pay. You can only go back one year from the date that you filed the application to collect the back money. So, Jordan, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves because we really should talk about how this whole process works. So, first thing we do is we have to file a claim. And you could do that on your own or you can contact our office or any other law office that does Social Security work to file that claim. It's really important that if you get assistance in filing these claims or pursuing your Social Security disability claim that you get an experienced attorney who handles these type of legal matters. So number one is you file a claim. You do that on the Social Security website. And once you file a claim, and give the proper documentation, which we'll discuss in a few minutes, you wait for the initial Social Security decision. Now, that usually takes how long, Jordan? Typically about six to eight months at this point for a decision. Since the pandemic, they've been very short-staffed. It's been taking a lot longer for decisions to come in. So we're expecting a normal wait time of about six to eight months for a decision on the initial application. So once you get a decision, it could be positive, 
And if it's negative, you go to the next step in the process, and that is reconsideration. How long has that taken? What's that all about? So reconsideration is, is decided in much the same way that the initial application is decided. Again, about six to eight months for a decision. You don't have a hearing in front of a judge. You don't get to actually speak to the person making the decision in your case, but you can update Social Security with any new medical information, and they make another decision in your case. So that'll be the second step of the process. Social Security looks at all the medical evidence. They're not bound by the initial determination that denied your case. They look at the evidence again and make another decision. If it's approved, that's the end of the case. You don't have to do anything else. If the, case, if the claim is denied at that point, then the next step would be to file a request for hearing, where you actually have a hearing in front of an administrative law judge. Now, generally, how long does that take to get a hearing before an administrative law judge? So the time period fluctuates. It always goes up and down. But at this point, it's around six to nine months from when you file a request for hearing until you actually get a hearing date. Now, when you get a hearing date, they have to give you at least 75 days notice from the date that they send the notice out until the date that the hearing is actually scheduled to take place. So are the hearings in person or uh, on video? How, how are the hearings conducted? The hearings are conducted in person, on video, and over the phone. If you would like to have an in-person hearing, you're always allowed to request an in-person hearing and they have to grant that. So if that's something you want to do, that's something that you're always entitled to. You can also have a hearing over the phone where you'd be at home uh, talking to the judge. Uh, myself or Mr. Steinhardt, if we're representing you in the case, would also be on the line arguing to the judge why the evidence supports disability. And then they also have an option for video hearings where, again, you would be able to be at home, uh, have the hearing done over uh, Microsoft Teams, and again, the judge and either myself or Mr. Steinhardt would be with you arguing the case to the judge over the video screen. So there are three different ways that they're conducting hearings at this point. So, Jordan, what does the Social Security Administration and or the judge consider uh, in finding you disabled? What, what kind of evidence do you need to prove that you're disabled? So you're looking at two different types of evidence. There's subjective evidence. That's evidence of things that you tell your doctor, area, areas of pain that you're experiencing, fatigue, are you having headaches, migraines, things like that. Anything that's not going to be documented in an MRI, X-ray, things like that. Things along those lines where if you're having neck pain or you're having low back pain and you get an MRI, that's objective evidence. Those are things that you can show to the judge and say, okay, this is what the MRI shows. This is how severe the, the low back injury is. But they're looking at those types of evidence. And then there's also opinion evidence. That's evidence from your doctors that state what they feel your limitations are. Um, the Social Security claim could be based on physical impairments. It could be on mental impairments. And you don't have to pick one impairment and say, this is the reason why I'm disabled. It's a totality of all the impairments you suffer from. And it, Social Security then makes a determination of how limited you are and whether your overall capacity from a mental and physical standpoint would allow you to do full-time work. But they're looking at all of the evidence in your case. One thing that's really important is that, it, that you make sure that you tell your doctors all of the symptoms that you're going through. Because a lot of people, they could say to the judge, well, I'm dealing with all this fatigue. I can't even get out of bed. I'm spending three days a week in bed from morning until night. But if it's not documented in the medical records, it's not going to carry any weight with Social Security. So it's really important that your doctors are aware of the symptoms that you're experiencing and that you tell them whenever you have appointments, this is what I'm going through. This is how severe my impairments are. And this is why uh, I'm, I'm dealing. And these are the issues that I'm dealing with on a day to day basis. And make sure that it's documented, because even though my clients will say to, to me or to Jordan, well, the doctor knows that's not good enough. It's got to be written in the records. And I'll give you a specific example. Um, many of our disabled clients use canes. Well, where did you get the cane from? Well, I bought it at the Walmart or Walgreens or whatever. The point is, is not that you bought it. Was it recommended by your doctor? And it should be in the medical reports that it was recommended. And it should be noted in the medical reports that you could constantly use it. Now, it's only not only pains, but it's also other physical devices and also other pain that you're having. Things have to be in the record because otherwise the Social Security Administration and the administrative law judge will discount your testimony. It's really important that, that you do that. Another, oh, just sorry to interrupt, but another important thing is if you're experiencing swelling, especially in your lower extremities, if you have to elevate your legs, 
make sure your doctors are aware of that. That needs, that's another thing that could really interfere with your ability to work. And a lot of times people say that they're elevating their legs because of severe swelling, but they're not telling their doctors about it. And I've got clients that say, okay, well, I'm, I'm spending all day in a recliner. I'm elevating my legs all day because that's the only way I can reduce the swelling. Or I'm dealing with severe neuropathy, and that's the only thing that really helps with the pain and the pins and needles. It's got to be in the medical reports. Otherwise, Social Security is going to look at that and say, okay, how else is Social Security going to determine that that's something that, that you're required to do if it's not going to be documented by your medical providers in their reports? Jordan, also is medications that you're taking, and the doctors will prescribe a myriad of, of uh, medications, but if you're having side effects, please, please let your doctor know. Most of the reports we, we receive from doctors don't describe the side effects. When our client comes into the office and says, oh, this gabapentin or some other medication that I'm taking makes me tired, well, that's fine, but there's nothing in the doctor's record that indicate that. So make sure that you discuss with your doctor the effect of your medications. It's, it's really, really important. So now we want to review the top 10 misconceptions of Social Security disability. Jordan, go ahead. All right. The first one is people believe that if Social Security says I'm not disabled on the initial application, then that means I'm not disabled and I'm not going to ultimately get approved for benefits. That's not the case at all. Most people, unfortunately, when they file the initial application, get denied the first time around. That's why it's very important to go through the appeal process. So just because you get a denial from Social Security doesn't mean you're not going to ultimately win the case. Again, most people that get approved don't get approved on the initial application. So you've got to go through the appeal process. Just because Social Security initially says, we believe that you're able to return to your past job or there's some other work that you're able to do, that does not mean you should give up at all. Number two is, if your doctor says you cannot work, that is good enough to get Social Security disability. Not true. Your doctor is not a lawyer. He or she is a doctor, and they don't know the Social Security law. So just because your doctor says you're disabled and cannot work is not going to get you Social Security disability benefits. All right. The next one is that you're too young to get Social Security disability benefits. That is not the case. Now, it is true, it does get easier to get approved when you get closer to your full retirement age. They do relax the laws when you get to age 50, and again, even more so at age 55. But just because you're under the age of 50 doesn't mean it's impossible to get approved for Social Security disability benefits. It really just depends on the severity of your impairments. If your impairments are severe enough to keep you from doing any type of full-time work, regardless of your age, you can get approved for Social Security disability benefits. The next misconception is you got to be patient. And if you think your claim will be approved or acted upon within a few weeks, it's not going to happen. As we told you before, it could be at minimum six to eight months. It could be up to two years. So nothing works quickly with the Social Security Administration, unfortunately. And I know they're trying to improve the process but you got to be patient because it's going to take a while. Uh, the next misconception is if I'm really disabled, I will get Social Security disability without a problem. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. A lot of times you have to go through the appeal process. Social Security might not see the case the way that you do, the way that myself or Mr. Steinhardt see the case. So if Social Security doesn't approve the case right away, like I said before, that doesn't mean it's time to give up. That means it's time to, to go through the appeal process and keep going and do everything we can to get this case approved. All right. If I'm turned down by Social Security Administration, I shouldn't appeal the case because it's hopeless, time-consuming, and expensive. Not true. Definite misconception. It is time-consuming because, as we said, it takes a long time to appeal this case. But most lawyers, as we'll discuss with you in a few minutes, Take these cases on a contingency fee, so you won't have to pay attorney's fees if you lose the case. And certainly it's not hopeless, because the Social Security Administration, through the appeal process, makes mistakes, and they can be overturned very easily. So it's certainly worthwhile, if you can't work, to go through the appeals process. The next misconception is, if my doctor says I'll never get Social Security disability, I won't ever be able to get it. 
Again, your doctor is not an attorney. Your doctor, I'm sure, is very, very skilled in the medical field, but they don't know all the laws that go into Social Security disability. And there is a lot that, that um, the doctor might not be aware of as far as the rule changes when you reach certain ages. And also as uh, the, the ability to do your past work, the ability to do other work. The doctor is focused on your medical treatment. So don't Focus too much on whether your doctor says you're going to get disability or not going to get disability. That's something that your attorney could talk to you about. That's something the Social Security Administration will make a determination about. Your doctor is not the one that ultimately decides if you get approved or you get denied. So the next misconception is, well, my friend went through this whole process and he or she can help me. Please, please do not do that. Every case is different. The fact that your friend or even a relative gets those, got Social Security disability and they did it on their own doesn't mean they're going to be able to help you or know what to do to get through the process. So don't rely on a person who's not a lawyer that really doesn't know the whole Social Security system and, in fact, may have gotten lucky to get their benefits on their own. Um, the next misconception is if I can't do my former job, I'm disabled and I'll get Social Security disability benefits. That's not the case. If you're between the ages of 18 and 49, the standard for disability is are you able to do any work at all that exists in the national economy? So it doesn't matter if you're able to do your former job or not. It's a standard of whether there's any work at all, regardless of how much money you would get paid, regardless of way or whether you're way overqualified for another job. If there's any full-time work that you can do, you're not disabled under Social Security's laws. Now, that does change when you get to age 50 and then again at age 55. We're not going to get into that right now. It's a little bit more complicated. But uh, for anybody under the age of 50, you have to prove a complete inability to do any type of full-time work in order to qualify for benefits. The final misconception is that my attorney won't represent me unless he or she gets paid up front. That's not true. Social Security lawyers work on a contingency fee, which means that they only get paid if they win the case. They don't win the case, you don't pay them. So Jordan, why don't you explain how um, the fee structure works with our firm and um, a little bit about why you really should have an attorney to uh, process your claim. Incidentally, the law firm of Steinhardt, Siskin, and Lieberman will represent you from day one. We'll file the claim from you and go through all the appeals. You really don't have to wait till you get denied. So we're always available to start your claim from day one. Jordan, explain why you should need it. You should get an attorney. Okay, so happen to have here the book it contains the federal social security laws. It's a big book. It's a lot in here. I know I personally would not want to go in front of a judge without somebody that knows all of the details of the information in the federal social security laws book because there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot that you're going to want to, that, that could potentially come up when you have a hearing in front of a judge. So you want to make sure that you've got representation. You've got somebody that knows the ins and outs of social security law that can represent you and be your advocate to help you get approved for benefits every step of the way. How does my attorney get paid? Attorneys only get paid if you win your social security disability case. If you don't win the case, there's no fee at all for anything that your attorney does. If you do win the case, your attorney's fee will be 25% of the back pay, capped at whatever the Social Security fee cap is at the time your case is decided. Again, there is no fee for an attorney unless you win your case. So that wraps up basically the um, Social Security disability information. Our law firm, the law firm of Steinhardt, Siskin, and Lieberman, is available for free initial consultation. You can reach us at 410-766-7630 or on our website at www.steinhartlawfirm.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you.